In 1960, in Africa, the Belgian Congo received its independence and established its own government in what later became known as Zaire. The new leadership immediately aligned itself with Moscow and began a campaign of terrorism and destruction in order to eradicate all traces of opposition to itself. When the nation plunged into chaos, one of its provinces, called Katanga, decided it wanted no part of the Red Revolution. It declared its independence and offered to align itself with the West. The will of the people was expressed in the words of their leader, Moise Chambé, who declared to the world, we are seceding from chaos. Katanga remained a sea of calm amid the bloodshed and violence around it. And by this contrast, it became a thorn in the side of the central Congolese government, which now wanted to pull it back under its control. The Red Regime was not militarily strong enough to accomplish that by itself, so it asked the United Nations to do it for them. The excuse they gave was that they wanted the UN to put down rebellion and to restore law and order in the Congo. But everyone knew that was only a ploy. Katanga already had law and order. The UN sent most of its military forces not to the central Congo, where thousands of people were being massacred and where law and order were very much needed to be restored, but to Katanga, where they were not needed and definitely were not wanted. The UN declared it was contrary to its own charter to intervene in the internal affairs of the Congo and that it had no intention of doing so. But it was clear from the outset that this was not the truth. As some of the UN personnel even admitted later in their public speeches and books, the real purpose of the UN was to intervene in the Congo's internal affairs and to force an independent anti-communist state back under the rule of a communist puppet regime. The great irony in all this was that the free world was told and the American people firmly believed that the UN force had been sent to the Congo to protect it from communism. The documentary you are about to see was produced in the style of the period, which is to say the narration is rather formal by today's standards, but the facts contained are accurate in every detail. I can attest to that because of the research I was able to do while writing the book The Fearful Master, A Second Look at the United Nations. In fact, the entire first six chapters were devoted to the Katanga tragedy. I considered at that time that before we can judge the UN's words and public pronouncements about peace and human rights, we should first look at its deeds. As Lenin phrased it, words are one thing, actions another. I still think that approach to understanding the UN is a good one, and it's for that reason we have re-released this documentary. The film was made by a small group of private citizens in a last-ditch effort to mobilize American opinion in time to avert the disaster. But only a few prints were made, and those were viewed primarily by small audiences. And so even to this day, most Americans are completely unaware of what really happened in Katanga. The reason this story needs to be told after all these years is that we have not seen the last of the UN so-called peacekeeping forces. Unless Congress reacts to the reality of what is now called the New World Order, we are going to see a UN army used more and more to bring its peculiar brand of peace to the world. And the best way to envision that future is to know the past. It is with that in mind that we now present Katanga, the untold story. Everywhere the communist technique for conquest has been the same. First a front man or a group, 
to create confusion, incite racial hatred, foment internal strife, then move in and take over. Today, Africa is one of the most vital links in the Soviet chain of world conquest. Its untouched natural wealth has perhaps a greater potential than that of the rest of the world combined. Strategically, the key to Africa is the Congo. And the key to the Congo is an area about the size of France, the state of Katanga. In custom and tradition, the Katangese differ from the other Congolese, much as we differ from some of our Latin American neighbors. Their government is patterned on Western lines. Their president, Moy Chambé, received his early schooling from Methodist missionaries in Katanga and subsequently studied in Europe. With political independence from Belgium, control of the entire Congo was turned over to what is called the Central Congo Government with headquarters in Leopoldville. But the state of Katanga saw no reason to accept the jurisdiction of the central government, for historically, Katanga had always been a separately administered state, even before the days of the Belgian Congo. They further considered the central government to be communist infiltrated and dominated, and they wanted no part of such a coalition. The people, therefore, declared Katanga to be an independent republic and went on record before the world as being militantly anti-communist and pro-Western in their sympathies. This is the story of Katanga's tragic fight for freedom and independence and of the efforts of the United Nations to force it back into a coalition government with the central Congo. Our story begins not in Katanga, but in the central Congo capital of Leopoldville. June 1960, King Baudouin of Belgium arrives in Leopoldville, capital of the central Congo, to grant independence to the newly created central Congolese government headed by the communist-trained premier Patrice Lumumba and the political opportunist Kasavubu as president. Here the king, followed by the diplomatic corps and Congolese government heads, file into the chamber of deputies in the national palace where the elaborate independence ceremony is to take place. These historic pictures show the solemn young king reading the document that grants the Congo a premature independence an independence to which the Belgians were forced by strong United Nations pressure and the threat of communist guerrilla warfare in which all the whites in the Congo would be massacred. As the king concludes, President Kasavubu formally accepts independence for the Congo. But then Lumumba takes the stand and he cannot resist using the solemn occasion to heap insult on the Belgians and their king. The historic ceremony completed, the embarrassed king and his entourage leave the ultra-modern National Palace, which only recently completed was an independence gift of the Belgian people to the Congolese. They leave to attend the official independence mass at the Church of San Maria. Upon leaving the church, the popular king is hailed by an excited crowd seeking a glimpse of the youthful king who has now ceased to be their official head of state. The dominant question now, can a largely untrained people rise to the challenge of independent statehood or will the Congo become prey to anarchy? The Congo, now an autonomous state, the Belgians, according to agreement, strike their flag and prepare to leave. Here the Belgian troops line up the last time before departure for inspection by their commanding officer. With the forced departure of the Belgian administration, the unprepared Congo loses its strongest base for political and economic stability. Into the resultant vacuum swept a bewildering array of over 60 political parties of which the communist-supported Lumumba bloc emerged as the ruling power. The Europeans and Congolese, bidding the Belgians goodbye, do not yet realize that they are also saying farewell to order and the rule of law. 
Here the Belgian troops leave in U.S. Air Force Globemasters, provided courtesy of the U.S. State Department. With the departure of the Belgian troops, red agitators, following the classic pattern of creating ultimate chaos, out of which the communists will emerge as victors, appealed to the nationalistic fervor of the masses, thus skillfully laying the groundwork for eventual communist takeover. Here, communist Lumumba, convicted thief, exercises his demagogic talents, like all communists, Lumumba makes his bid for power by promising the people unattainable economic and political gains. In the immediate future of the Congo, this hate-motivated red agent, as he was called by one of the central Congolese ministers, was to leave behind him a wake of violence, climaxed by rape and mass murder. The red plot to gain control of the entire Congo goes into effect. Communist-led hordes, augmented by central Congo army units, mount a reign of terror. Resultant riots throw the Congo into a turmoil that completely paralyzes any effort to establish an effective government and economic stability. Leaderless armed central Congolese troops, promised aristocratic privileges in a Lumumba-controlled Congo, go on the rampage, killing all opposition and terrorizing the civilian population raping, looting, and pillaging stores and private homes. Their primary goal in Lumumba's words to exterminate the white race in the Congo. This previously suppressed footage shows a plane load of refugees, mostly women, who after having been beaten and raped by the red incited hordes, managed miraculously to flee to safety. These pictures require no words. The shocked condition of these people the terror and fright in their eyes reflect the unspeakable bestialities that befell them. Poleville, thousands of uprooted, bewildered, and terrorized Europeans, among them doctors, engineers, technicians, and teachers, whose skills were essential to an efficient and smoothly running Congo economy, line up with their families to leave. Many of these people had been born in the Congo, but suddenly found themselves deprived of country, home, life savings, and a secure future for their families. With the loss of these vitally needed skills, the Congo economic system collapses. Unemployment, famine, and epidemics strike. Central Congolese industry employing thousands is forced to shut down, and people in search of jobs and food become migratory. Congolese tribesmen, many of them still at a Stone Age level, flock to the cities wooed by Lumumba's promises. Production stops, supply lines collapse, the first step toward communist takeover of the Congo has been achieved. The entire Congo, with the exception of Katanga, is engulfed in chaos. The central government declares martial law. Alarmed by the massacre of the civilian population, Belgian troops re-enter the Congo to arrange for the safe conduct and evacuation of all Europeans. While violence and chaos prevail in the rest of the Congo, life takes its normal course in Katanga province. The old traditions mingle with the hustle and bustle of the modern close-by city of Elizabethville. Elizabethville, where the streets are filled with the sounds of healthy economy, and where in contrast to the rest of the Congo, all lines of communication are operating smoothly with airplanes, and trains arriving and departing on regular schedules. While the city itself 
is a picture of flourishing business and prosperity. The peace and calmness surrounding Katanga is deceptive and fragile. An industrial and well-developed Katanga is the key to Congo control, and thus the primary target for communist takeover. These pictures, better than words, illustrate why Katanga is a prized possession to the communists. While most of the factories in the central Congo are shut down due to lack of skilled European personnel who have been massacred or deported by Lumumba's gang, Katangi's industry is in full production, providing employment and income for tens of thousands of Katangis and their families, assuring them of a living standard and a secure future unequaled anywhere else in the Congo. There are several vital reasons for the communist onslaught to control Katanga. Katanga, with huge hydroelectric power plants, could at full capacity supply the entire Congo with electricity, which marks it as a prime target toward any attempt toward the takeover. But the prize catch for the communists is Katanga's mighty Union Minière, an internationally owned mine which produces 60% of the world's cobalt and 8% of the world's supply of copper. It was a Katangese mine which supplied the United States with element U-235, an ingredient vital in the production of the first atomic bomb. What is the background for Katanga's prosperity and economic success? Katanga's critics point to her fabulous wealth of natural resources as the only answer. This is not true. Katanga has natural mineral resources, but it is not singularly blessed with riches. Other provinces in the Congo, equally large or larger than Katanga, such as Kasai and Kivu, have the same industrial potential, a potential they have never realized. The reasons for Katanga's success are not alone her natural resources, but her people, who in an intelligent and industrious way are willing to develop their assets within the frame of the free enterprise system. This encourages investments which in turn increase production. And in a peaceful, cooperative, and harmonious relationship, they draw on the superior skills of European technicians to supervise production and to teach a growing number of skilled Katangese to carry on in progress where the Western powers left off. Katanga realizes that a successful future must be based on a sound public school system. This is a typical Katangese school in which European teachers are enlisted in the national drive for better education. Katanga has an excellent and expanding school system from primary to university level. In its many hospitals and health centers, children and adults receive modern medical care and instruction in first aid. A large number of schools in Katanga are mission schools, generously supported and encouraged by the Katangese government. They are staffed with missionaries from all over the world who are widely respected and admired and who receive full support from the population. In addition to regular classes for children, these schools also provide adult courses in a variety of subjects ranging from hygiene and baby care to home economics. In July 1960, threatened by communist infiltration and violence from the central Congo, Katanga declared its independence and elected Moy Shambe president of the Republic of Katanga. Here is President Shambe as he arrives in Elizabeth. The appeal of Shambe to Congolese, black and white alike, is unique, but in closer analysis, easy to understand. Not even his enemies can deny his vibrant personality, his intelligence, and his dedication to the Republic. Shambe's stand for the political freedoms cherished by the Western world have gained him the savage hatred of the communists, but it is clear that he has won the hearts of his own people.
While most of the missionary schools are Protestant and Shambe himself a Methodist, the Catholics are given equal opportunity for the practice and dissemination of their faith. Here is President Shambe in company with the Catholic bishop in Elizabethville. The same freedom is enjoyed by the Jewish community in the city, the existence of which may surprise you as it did me on the occasion of my visit recently. I was invited to attend a bar mitzvah ceremony by Rabbi Silverbaum, the spiritual leader of the Jewish community. At this confirmation service, President Shambe was an honored guest. These people are Katangi citizens, Jews who found religious freedom in this part of Africa. The family was as delighted as any American family would be if our own president should drop in to extend his congratulations on such an occasion. Leopoldville, the political crisis becomes acute. Blocked in its efforts to communize the Congo and overturn independent Katanga, the communist elements in the central government seek desperately for a device which will reverse the ebbing tide of red fortunes. In the face of food riots and widespread disorder, Lumumba's militia resorts to the classic technique of restoring order. In a shrewd play for world opinion, Lumumba turns to the United Nations in an appeal for United Nations forces to keep his regime from toppling, confident that the Soviet bloc therein will not be deaf to his plea. Here, Lumumba and his advisors prepare to leave for UN headquarters in New York in what he terms a goodwill visit to the United States. This trip was hailed in the world Soviet press as a supreme peace mission. Here is Lumumba arriving in Idlewild, where he receives the same warm welcome from the U.S. State Department that was accorded such communists as Khrushchev and Castro before him. A grateful Lumumba makes immediate use of our free press and radio to muster support for his cause. His remarks were enthusiastically received. Later, Lumumba was whisked off to Washington where he was wined and dined and where he stayed in the president's official guest house. Parenthetically, Shambay was thrice denied a visa by the U.S. State Department and was unable to present the Katanga story in the United States. In the U.N., Lumumba, addressing the General Assembly, puts the blame for Congo massacres and riots on the re-entry of Belgian troops and demands United Nations intervention to forcibly and finally evict them from the Congo. He attacks the Republic of Katanga as the principal obstacle to Congo unity and demands its capitulation to the rule of the central government. Joining in the applause, ironically, are representatives of some of the smaller nations who had only recently achieved their own independence. The UN, under strong pressure from the Soviet bloc and so-called weather vane neutrals, led by Pandit Nehru of India, throw their full support to Lumumba. In this, they are joined by the United States. Mixed contingents of UN troops are dispatched to the Congo to force the Belgians out, leaving the white population and any further opposition once again at the mercy of Lumumba's hordes. While Belgian troops once again leave the Congo, the UN lands troops of mixed nationalities, such as Swedes, Indians, and Ethiopians, who are almost totally ignorant of the actual situation. Transported by Russian ships, a heavily armed contingent of UN combat troops disembarks at a Congo coastal town. Secretary General of the UN, Dag Hammarskjöld, arrives in Leopoldville to personally supervise the UN occupation of the Congo. He is greeted by President Kasavubu. The UN troops enforcing Lumumba's dictates commit serious breaches of international conduct. 
Here, in violation of his diplomatic immunity, UN troops forced the Belgian ambassador Jean van den Bosch at gunpoint out of his embassy and expel him from the Congo. With the Belgians forcibly evicted, the central Congolese government, supported and advised by UN forces, starts an arms race toward the build-up of a central Congolese military striking power. Security is tightened in a move to suppress the growing masses of discontented Congolese, whose concept of independence was not that of a military dictatorship. While UN and central government forces combine their strengths, which include all the destructive machinery of modern warfare, the world press cheers the peace efforts of the United Nations in the Congo. Taking advantage of the situation, Congolese government is quick to propagandize through the UN that with Belgians removed from the Congo, the only obstacle to a successful unification is now independent Katanga, which, paradoxically enough, through all the chaos and military buildup around it, has maintained the most peaceful and stable economy in the Congo. While the UN tightens Congo security and flexes its muscles in a parade of strength, raped and persecuted nuns, missionaries and civilians continue to flee the central Congo. All this while central Congolese President Kasabubu is busy catering to influential guests such as Soviet Minister Valerian Zorin. Here, Kasavubu welcomes Dr. Ralph Bunch, who represents the wealthy and generous United States. Dag Hammarskjöld, Secretary of the United Nations, calls on Kasavubu for a top-level conversation. Subject? how to crush Katanga's independence and force it to accept the rule of the central government. What came out of these talks was the old reliable Trojan horse plan. The United Nations unconditionally pledged to Chambay that if he permitted United Nations forces to enter temporarily, it would pledge absolutely no interference in Katanga's internal affairs. Thus assured, Chambay, in a show of good faith toward the World Organization, permitted the entry. Since America is a part of the United Nations, we are called on to do our share and respond dutifully. These UN troops, who will shortly occupy Katanga, were transported by United States Globemasters. In a gesture that was a curious compound of goodwill and some inner doubts, Chambé and his aides pay an unheralded visit to the United Nations headquarters in Elizabethville to welcome the troops. The atmosphere is friendly on both sides, and there is little to hint that the United Nations forces are anything but temporary visitors. Here, Chambé, with the aid of an interpreter, is chatting with some of the Irish officers in command. If the number of troops and their military equipment have given him any premonition of what was to come, he still obviously relied at this point on the assurances given to himself and his people. His presence quite naturally attracts the curiosity of many onlookers, and when he leaves, a crowd of well-wishers, both Europeans and natives, wave a friendly farewell. In September 1960, the Central Congo erupts into another major crisis. Masses of Central Congolese riot against the openly communistic strong arm activities of the government. President Kasavubu, in a face-saving gesture, dismisses Lumumba. But crafty Lumumba, backed and protected by the UN, maintains that he cannot be dismissed and defiantly continues the liquidation of his enemies under the direct protection of the UN. Here, smiling and self-confident, Lumumba shows the reporters the official documents that appointed him premier of the central Congo government and boasts that he still is and always will be the number one man in the Congo. 
he points in triumph to the signatures on the document. The Congolese parliament, riddled with communists, protests Lumumba's dismissal and renders it void. Later, ten parliament members who voted against Lumumba were shot by Lumumba's police. His authority back to the limit by UN forces, Lumumba again plunges the Congo into chaos and bloody violence, behind which he makes his final bid for total power. Comrade Lumumba, receiving too much adverse publicity in the eyes of the world to be able to much further the cause of communism in the Congo, was soon to disappear from the scene under mysterious circumstances. March 21, 1961, after Lumumba's mysterious death, President Chambay, on his own initiative and to demonstrate willingness to solve troubles of a plagued Congo, meets with leaders of the central government and of Kasai province to work toward Congo unification and to block communist advance. At this conference, Chambay reiterates that Katanga's succession had taken place primarily to resist the communist dictatorship of Lumumba. But the UN ignores completely the efforts of legitimate Congo leaders to settle the Congo's internal problems and continues to back the communist faction now headed by Gizenga, an acknowledged Soviet agent. Here Gizenga arrives in Leopoldville to fill the power gap left by Lumumba. Supported by the UN, he declares himself Lumumba's successor and the new premier in the Congo. In this, he was immediately acclaimed and supported by the Soviet bloc nations and the world left-wing press. Gizenga settled for a vice premiership when Adula agreed to follow the Lumumba line. February 21, 1961, the UN Security Council, in disregard of its charter and solemn pledges, authorizes UN troops the use of armed force with the announced purpose of restoring order in the Congo. Disregarding peaceful conditions in Katanga, the United Nations, prodded by the central government, uses this as a pretext to build up its military force in Katanga and pours troops and heavy equipment into the new republic. Although repeatedly warned, the UN commits a tactless breach in international relations when it insists on sending white troop contingents, some of which consider the African a vastly inferior human being. These troops, well trained and equipped with superior late model arms, form the nucleus of UN striking power in the Congo. The UN military buildup in Katanga grinds into high gear as more and more troops begin to arrive. Here jet bombers manned by Indian pilots are flown into peaceful Katanga to build up UN air power. These jets equipped with rockets, bombs and machine guns. Here the Indian pilots are welcomed by the UN commander. All over the Congo, UN officers take stock of their military power. The Russians operating out of public view do not send troops, instead send technicians and agents who penetrating to the top level of the central government exert Soviet influence. These innocent-looking wooden crates contain Czechoslovakian-made arms and ammunition. Soon the Congo is flooded with communist arms and ammunition. Here, surrounded by the press and feigning complete ignorance of a fact known by every Congolese official, are central government representatives confronted with a sample from a large stockpile of communist munitions in Leopoldville. The symptom of surprise that the discovery exhibited for the benefit of reporters is not very convincing. But the fact remains unchanged. Many of these bullets are designed to kill in Katanga. 
In Katanga, in the meantime, tension mounts as UN troops, disregarding their agreement with Shambay's government not to interfere in any way with Katanga's internal affairs, establishes a tight military security and control. As barbed wire barricades, roadblocks, and checkpoints go up, and certain areas are sealed off limits to all Katangese, it becomes increasingly clear that UN forces have established a military law and rule in Katanga which is synonymous with a military occupation of enemy territory. UN troops, in an obvious transgression on civil rights, stop and check cars and civilians, at the same time occupying all strategic junctions within the city. The Katangese population becomes concerned over military restrictions and with interference with their daily business and lives. In Elizabethville, capital of Katanga, which has the strongest concentration of UN forces, the population protests the United Nations interference into their sovereign affairs. They stage a peaceful and orderly demonstration. Here, Katangese citizens, carrying banners which asks for a halt to UN interference, parade the streets of Elizabethville. The demonstration starts to break up when President Chambé appears to reassure his people and ask them to return to their homes. But the UN, in an abrupt action, takes matters very quickly into their own hands as heavily armed UN troops and vehicles ruthlessly bear down on the crowd and disperse them at gunpoint. They forcibly clear the streets and impose military curfew on the entire city. The people of Katanga have no choice but to accept the fact that the UN has established a military dictatorship over their country. April 24, 1961. With pressure and tension mounting in Katanga, Shambé agrees to attend a second meeting of Congolese leaders to implement the agreements reached at the previous conference of March 1961. This meeting, held in the city of Coquilapville, was under the direct control of the Central Army. In a treacherous move by Kasavubu, Shambay is stripped of his diplomatic immunity and jailed under brutal conditions until June 22nd. During his imprisonment, the UN command, in flagrant disregard of its agreement, forcibly deports all Katangese civil service workers and army officers of European descent. In defiance, they wave the flag of Katanga. August 8, 1960. Here is the official statement issued by the Security Council. We quote, The UN forces in the Congo will not be a party to, or in any way intervene in, or be used to influence the outcome in internal conflict, constitutional or otherwise. Unquote. Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld went on to make this more explicit. The United Nations force cannot be used on behalf of the central government to subdue or to force the provincial government of Katanga to a specific line of action. September 13, 1961, and here is how that policy was carried out. UN forces under the command of Connor Cruz O'Brien bring peace by unleashing a vicious and unprovoked assault on Elizabethville. Katangese fighting to preserve their freedom strike back. The superior UN war machine in a surprise action against ill-equipped Katangese forces counts on a speedy victory. But the Katangese, white and black alike, rising as one man, put up a fierce resistance that stops the UN invaders in their tracks and finally forces them to retreat. An astonished world hears the news that a superior mechanized UN legion of war was forced to retreat before a militarily inferior fighting force of determined patriots. But freedom has its price, and Katangese casualties are high and the wounded numerous. To Katangese who lost loved ones in this battle, it may be that the magic words United Nations no longer symbolize universal peace and the brotherhood of man. Of course, it may be that they are prejudiced. Indiscriminate UN mortar and machine gun fire makes no distinction between civilian and soldier, old and young. As in most wars, it is the innocent who are hurt and have to carry the heaviest burden of man's inhumanity to man. The UN Unable to achieve its goal of subjugating Katanga to the central government, bides its time and agrees to a ceasefire. Here, President Chambé attends a meeting under UN auspices to conclude an agreement which reaffirms Katanga's right to remain independent of the central government and again assures Katanga of non-interference by UN forces into internal Katanga affairs. Even as Chambé negotiates, 
UN forces make their way through the rubble of Shell Katangi's homes and businesses in search of African souvenirs. And in Leopoldville, President Kasabubu, assured of help in a personal note from Khrushchev, calls a cabinet meeting to plan future moves against Katanga. In Katanga, people pay homage to those who gave their lives for their country. In a church in Elizabethville, war widows, many of them carrying their children, attend the church requiem for Katanga's war victims. Their flag is at half mast, for this too is Flanders Field. We are the dead, short days ago we lived, saw dawn, felt sunset glow, loved and were loved. But for the living, there is much work to be done. Now relying on UN promises, Katanga must rebuild. It must grow, step up production, and more than ever demonstrate to a largely hostile world the vitality of its industry and of its people. In spite of their recent sorrow, readjustment to normal life quickly takes place. In their off time, Katangis enjoy gymnastics and sports, and for the enjoyment of old and young, games such as sack hopping and barrel rolling. In Katanga, all social life centers around the family. The Kutawis are representative of many thousands of married couples in this country. Their home is a modest one. It does not have many of the conveniences and luxuries of the West, but it is spotless and in striking contrast to the huts and shacks seen elsewhere in the Congo. While the peace and work of everyday life once again descends upon the Katangis, the UN takes advantage of the truce by pouring unprecedented numbers of combat troops and military equipment into Katanga. Russian ships continue to unload crates filled with arms and ammunition, and unmarked Russian airplanes, always at the disposal of Central Congo needs, day and night airlift Central Congolese soldiers to Katanga, troops which, according to UN policy and statement, were not to be employed in a fight against Katanga. More UN jets arrived to reinforce the already sizable US-built jets. An Ethiopian pilot flying a U.S. Sabre jet arrives at a U.N.-occupied airfield in Katanga, where he is greeted by the U.N. commander. U.N. forces steadily reinforce the already nearly 20,000 men armed with bazookas, machine guns, tanks, and 75-millimeter field artillery, as matched against Katanga's army of several thousand men are now deployed at all strategic points of Elizabethville, ready at moment's notice to launch an attack with superior forces. Over and over again, the UN assures President Chambay that the United Nations has no further intention of intervening in Katanga's internal affairs, nor intention of again employing armed force against Katanga. These statements are taken in good faith. But as they are made almost simultaneously, UN planes take to the air to drop communist-style leaflets on Baluba villages in Katanga. This in an effort to incite the tribesmen into a bloody insurrection against the Katangese government. And giant US Air Force Globemasters in a continuous and gigantic operation ferry UN troops and combat gear into Katanga. At the provocation of the communist infiltrated central government, the situation in Katanga assumes more and more the explosive possibilities of a powder keg. Three months after the first initial UN attack on Katanga on a quiet day, November 21st, 1961, the powder keg explodes into bloody violence as UN forces to request the central government to subjugate at any cost and crush Katanga to its authority in a final drive forge ahead supported by jet fighters and bombers to clear a path of death and destruction, which not only makes a mockery of the UN resolution to the world not to use force to advance the cause of the communist-backed central government, but also shatters the myth of UN forces sent to the Congo to bring peace. The UN command, remembering the Katangese fighting potential, is not taking any chances this time. 
to destroy resistance by Katangese military and civilians, Elizabethville receives a devastating shelling from bombers, field artillery, and bazookas. The strategic policy, a complete reign of terror. After which, UN troops supported by tanks and armored cars zip into the heart of Elizabethville, converging on all points of resistance, grimly determined to end Katangese independence and to establish central government dictatorship. At the heart of the city, UN advance is halted when Katangese, including Europeans, make a stand and in close range combat that ranges for eight hours, puts up a fierce resistance to UN advance. But the odds are uneven, and the Katangese, vastly outgunned by numerically superior and much better equipped UN forces, are being pushed back. It is soon apparent that the Katangese are fighting a losing battle against the powerful UN forces. UN troops advancing from all sides systematically wipe out all resistance pockets, and in the process, machine guns and bazooka civilian cars trying to escape from the city, killing many innocent civilians running for their lives to find cover from UN fire. This truck, which had made an attempt to carry refugees, among them women and children, out of Elizabethville, was deliberately bazookaed by UN Ethiopian troops. Looking at this picture, these words from the UN Charter come to mind. To stand together in common dedication to the cause of liberty and peace, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights and in the dignity of the work of the human person. Words which were made a mockery of by UN action. The UN consolidates its forces in a final drive to crush all remaining resistance and to force the unconditional capitulation of Katanga as Katangese surrender to the UN. UN patrols make their way through the rubble and burning ruins of what was only days before a lively and sovereign city. A picture of wanton destruction executed by the world's foremost peace organization. His people in severe distress and Elizabethville at the verge of destruction, Shambe speaks to a hurriedly gathered assembly of the international press and appeals desperately to President Kennedy and the free world to stop the senseless slaughter. Shambe takes reporters on an eyewitness tour of an Elizabethville hospital, which although clearly identified by Red Cross markings and flags, had been bombed and shelled by the UN. December 21st, 1961. In a last-ditch effort to protect his people, Shambay literally puts his head into the lion's mouth when he flies to Katona to discuss peace with the central government. Shambay does not turn to the UN, as it is clear that the attack on Katanga came at the direct request of the central government. A truce is declared when Shambay vows a scorched-earth policy that will leave the conquerors nothing but ashes if the invasion continues. Returning to Elizabethville, Shambay tells his people that Katanga will not oppose Congo unification if it is permitted enough self-government to prevent a communist takeover. But the price of Katanga's fight for freedom has been heavy. Streets once busy and filled with a healthy sound of traffic and trade are deadly quiet and almost deserted. The Katangese economy comes to a standstill. Communication centers, the radio station, the post office are destroyed. Power lines and telephone wires are down. Katanga reels from this savage blow. Casualties are high. Volunteers aid the Red Cross in working around the clock. Hospitals are severely damaged, overcrowded, and without electric power. Doctors have to perform emergency operations under petroleum or candlelight. Many of the slain men and women were civilians who bore no arms. A sworn statement by 46 doctors at the scene characterizes as murder the action of UN troops in machine gunning civilians at Red Cross ambulances. The morgues in Elizabethville are filled to capacity. These are Red Cross ambulances spattered with the blood of their drivers. This in spite of the fact that the vehicles were clearly marked and in many cases driven by volunteer women drivers. 
They were machine gunned and torn to shreds by UN bazookas while carrying wounded and administering first aid. These are other strategic targets. Maternity hospitals, schools, nurseries, mental institutions, private homes, strafe shelled and bombed by UN jets and artillery. The Charter of the United Nations states, quote, to practice tolerance and live together in peace and to unite our strength to maintain international peace and security by the acceptance of principles and the institutions of methods that violence and armed force shall not be used. Duly grateful for UN efforts in behalf of his regime, President Casavubo makes a V for victory. The US dollar was decisive in winning. In military uniform, the Congo Commander-in-Chief salutes the UN troops to whom he owes so much. Although the 11 communist countries who maintain embassies at Leopoldville denounce the West for not reducing Katanga to utter ashes and dust, Kasavubu knows that the $200 million operation that saved him was financed almost entirely by the United States through the friendly cooperation of our State Department. Kasu was well aware of the support when he rolled out the carpet in September 1960 to receive G. Men and Williams, Under Secretary of State for African Affairs. Williams went to the Congo to see where the U.S. dollar should go and how it should be spent. You have seen the result. The U.S. State Department, beginning with Lumumba, has backed the central Congo government in full knowledge of its communist affiliations against free pro-Western Katanga. Fortunately for the central government, U.S. State Department backing was not changed by the cruel near-fatal beating of 14 American airmen by central Congolese troops. Even when such distinguished Americans as Herbert Hoover, Senator Dodd, Congressman Bruce and others tried to arouse American public opinion against these and other documented atrocities, they were actually accused by the United States Department of State of, quote, taking bribes. Communist dictators the world over, Khrushchev, Castro, Lumumba, are invited to our shores and fated lavishly. Africa's only outspoken anti-communist pro-Western leader, Moishambe of Katanga, was arbitrarily denied a visa to visit this country. The visa was denied when he was invited here by a group of American citizens who wanted to hear his side of the story. Why? In order to find out, I decided to visit Shambé in his own country halfway around the world. I asked President Shambé to give the American people a first-hand evaluation of what was going on. During the course of our interview, President Shambé was under great personal strain, for in that very hour, word had arrived that United Nations forces were preparing another all-out attack on Katanga. Here in simultaneous translation from the French are President Chambé's comments. Monsieur Jackson, je vous remercie beaucoup d'être venu nous rendre la visite. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. I'm fairly well. But as you may know, my health has suffered somewhat from my dungeon imprisonment at the hands of the central government when they tried to break me following the conference at Calculateville. But that is of little matter. The important question is the survival of our beloved Katanga. As you can see for yourself, at this very hour, no effort is spared by the United Nations to utterly destroy us. In this, it is being held by your own State Department. I'm sorry to have to say this, but tragically, it is true. Why? What have we done to your State Department? What have we done to the United Nations? What terrible crime have we committed that we should so deserve this? Well, it seems that our crime was that in an emerging Africa that is everywhere turning against the West and into the arms of the Soviet bloc, 
we, Katangis, asserted our loyalty to the West and our uncompromising hatred of communism. In an emerging world of socialized and communized industry and the seizure of private property, we have asserted our hatred of statism and our belief in and encouragement of private free enterprise. In a world of anti-individualism, we have asserted our belief in the fundamental dignity of the individual man and his right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As you have seen for yourself, here white and black live together as brothers of the human race with neither racial strife nor hatred. Our people work toward the common goals of free men. Are these the offenses? Are these the crimes that we're guilty of? You may perceive here a very interesting fact, which is this. In a communist Africa or in a communist Congo, a free Katanga would be an unbearable thorn in the side of the communists. An example of freedom which they could neither exploit or tolerate. Just as West Berlin is their thorn in Europe. Throughout the communist world and also in many Western nations, including your country, we Katangis have been viciously attacked by many political commentators. They have accused us of being tools in the hand of the colonialists, that we are cheap exploiters of the rest of the Congo, and that the rest of the Congo could not survive without political control over Katanga. Well, the vicious lies and propaganda that they are spreading against us is just what they said about the free China before she fell to the hands of the communists. The propaganda against Chiang Kai-shek was vital to their conquest. And Mr. Castro, he was just another agrarian reformer too, remember? Well, today we have a United Nations full of political commentators of the same stripe. The United Nations pretext for attacking us is that the Katangese army took the initiative in the attacks of September and December 1961, just as the Chinese Reds alleged when they invaded Korea. The United Nations, on the 28th day of August 1961, surprised us by a lightning attack. At 4 o'clock in the morning, on the post office square, at the railroad station, at the radio stations, everywhere, innocent Katangese men, women and children, civilians and military personnel were senselessly massacred. Next, they waged an all-out war on the economy. Not only did they bomb our industrial plants, but our freight trains and roads, they paralyzed our farms and our water supplies. But one thing they did not count upon was the will of the Katangese to be free. We're not so easily broken, even when the governments of the world seem to be against us. Our enemies have the war-making tools and propaganda machine of vast empires. We have only the simple truth of our beliefs and our desire to be free. I do not know how much longer we can hold out against the limitless pressures but we shall not hesitate to spend our last drop of blood for our freedom if it is so required. That, I believe, is what your own countrymen did at Bunker Hill. Mr. Jackson, I thank you so very much for your visit here. I'm especially grateful to our friend, Senator Dodd, and to that large section of the American people you both represent. Tell them that the Katangese want to be their friends. But do not hide from them the fact that our people oppose those policies of your present Washington administration, policies which are laying certain ground for communism in the Congo and in all Africa. Thank you, and may God be with you.